Turn it off, turn it on. Yes, yes, it's working again. Okay, everybody. Okay, we had some mixed up with the lists because it was gone. So I quickly printed a new one. I'm going to pass it to, please, if you have a list, strike your name. Then we know enough and give it to your neighbor. And we hope to find it out. So starting here. And then, uh, please, a warm welcome for Tiago. Thank you. Can everybody, can everybody, yeah, yeah, you can hear me. Uh, first, everyone, uh, first amazing question. Who here is an architect? <laughs> Who here is an architect but is afraid to raise their hand? <laughs> yeah, some people. Uh, my goal here is not to say that you are horrible people and you should get fired. That's not the overall idea of this. Uh, I just wanted to share a bit, a little, about how architecture and uh, DevOps kind of was something that always intrigued me a lot. So to start a bit, it's good to give you some, some context. My name is Tiago. I'm originally from uh, Brazil. I've been living here for four years and a half, but I don't want to go into shame and start speaking in Dutch. Uh, I lived in other places before, after I left uh, Brazil, and uh, I really, really enjoy the country. I have been working at Lincoln now for almost three years, and we are very successful in the sourcing thing, in the data shedding part, but that's not what I do precisely there. I'm responsible for the solutions part, and that means that I don't care if it's gonna be on Google Cloud, AWS, Java, .NET, Golang, or whatever, I'm gonna help your company to achieve something. Uh, focus on the business problem together with the team that we have, that now for the solutions engineers, especially on the data and on the engineering part, are more than 40 solutions engineers now working with me. And I have been always been working on the data part of things. Since I graduated from university, I did theoretical math, so I was doing research on like negative surface and negative curvatures and stuff that I don't know why I did that 10 years ago. Uh, <laughs> And then I went into software uh, development more. I did my master around machine learning in a time that support vector machines were all that you can do. And then it was really fun. I started going into actual development and I did a lot of roles from network engineering, sysadmin, database administrator, wrote some parts of a database with sharding. And, uh, uh, and then I started to get into the things around DevOps, I think five to six years ago but into the human part of it, because technology for me, it's not the biggest problem. You can learn from it, but humans are quite fascinating. Uh, and I joined the DevOps Stichting here in the Netherlands when I came a few years ago, and we are the ones that organize DevOps Days, Amsterdam. I had quite some fun with it. I meet a lot of people, but I was always, always, always impressed about architects and enterprises, because how long does it take for a new idea to go into production in a place like ABM? Do you have any clue? 10 years, I hear someone. I think that's a little bit exaggerated, but uh, maybe nine? One year? Wow, I think you are very, very optimistic. <laughs> uh, and, and when I try to to actually identify what is the problem. Oh, no, this one. Uh, when I tried to actually identify what the problem is, I started to see that architects are usually really, really far from the trenches, from the reality of things. Uh, for the last 10 years, because DevOps Day is hand, it's gonna be 10 years now in October, the first one. Uh, uh, for the last 10 years, we, we have been talking about Lean and Agile and Kata and ways of working and the true ways and the flow and overcoming observability, empathy. A lot of these things have been hot trends around the DevOps movement for the last years. Now it's all about observability. Two years ago it was all about empathy. Some years ago it was all about communication, all of it. Uh, we are now treating infrastructure as code. We are using CloudFormation or Terraform. We are deploying with, I hope, with some configuration management that you have, at least with Ansible or Chef or Puppet or, I don't know, if you're going to South or anything else before that. 
we are building the serverless applications, we're talking about reactive architectures, we're doing all of this fancy stuff about event-driven things, but in the end, what we all want is to move faster, is to build cooler stuff to move faster, and to make more money, and to make the client happy. However, I have seen a very, very few discussions about architectures in large enterprises that are not about TOGAF or standards or all this stuff that for me doesn't make any sense at all in this world that we live. Uh, so usually you have to talk with several layers of architects. You have solutions architects and domains architects and business architects and enterprise architects and CISO has to be involved with security architecture and all of these things that come with it with their own committee meetings and limited time to evaluate and give feedback of their stuff that you are doing and doing SharePoints and PPT presentations and Microsoft Visual and all the stuff that comes. Is it okay to build this? Is it okay to operate this in production? Is it okay to design this? Is the support chain defined? I, I don't even know if this is gonna go into production or who is gonna use it. How am I gonna define a support chain about something now? Like some companies even issue permissions to be able to design a system. It's kind of like you have to ask someone to think at some point. And I'm not here again to say that architects are bad people. I'm just saying that in the majority of the cases, you get so far from the trenches because you are overloaded with ideas and things that you have to build and the stuff that you have taken into account and compliance and GDPR that you start to lose trust. The fact that a developer needs approval or permission to do something goes against with what we have been preaching. Small, empowered, independent teams. And the other thing is, this lack of trust is because an architect, when something goes wrong, the CTO is gonna call the VP or the director or the manager is gonna call, and ultimately, the person that is gonna be called upon when there is a data breach is gonna be the architect. And that fact that you have to pinpoint someone in that blaming culture that comes with a role of being an architect is really this lack of trust. They want to micromanage everything because it's their ass on the line. This lack of trust and at the same fact being away from reality, it's really, really freezing how things are being built at some companies. Uh, and let's not go even into safe now because I have a lot to say about safe, but please take me away from it now, now, just for a second. Because what we have now with architect is similar to this. This is a almost 10 year old joke about marketing that uh, people design it products without knowing if customers actually wanted that. And this ivory towers perspective, uh, this is really what I see like and to be honest, for the architects and people that write stuff into Confluence and SharePoint and all of it, how much of that is actually how it is implemented? How much of that is actually what you just show to auditors when you wanna get your compliance or something else? Uh, not, and we're not just building one application like we used to do before. Like 10 to 20 years ago, one company was building one monolith application with thousands of people working on it, but one application deployed into production at some point, or some, five, ten. Now we're talking about APIs and uh, different things that a small company like Ball.com has, a small company I mean, it's an e-commerce website. It's not building a rocket or anything. An e-commerce website has, uh, has at least, I think, 50 to 100 teams building at least 300 to 400 APIs. I think you work there at Ball.com, so you may know. Uh, as a result of this, this necessity of having to continuously deploy and doing stuff, it's, it, this cannot wait anymore for all these committees, all these roles to go into this perspective. And somebody there on the top of the tower shouting out, yeah, it's okay to build this. Or have you followed what is on the insight or what is on the SharePoint page, something, something. This is not how the world moves anymore. Uh, I think that the reality that we bring to IT is something like this. This concept of thoroughly designing things, thinking about the system. I have been into places where people come to me and say, 
hey, Tiago, we need to build exactly this. We had this amazing architect. He just left the company now, but he did an amazing job. I was like, oh, nice. What did he build? No, we have all this documentation. Documentation is amazing, but just documenting something how it should be is really, really different from documenting what it is there. And especially if you document something that doesn't exist yet, that is just a dream. So, Tiago, you're saying that we should just build stuff. Should move as a startup. No. First, enterprises are not startup. And I'm not saying that with the bad meaning that some people take of the word enterprise. I don't want to work in an enterprise environment. It's not like that. I'm saying that enterprise have other problems. Things move slower because you have several factors to take into account. You have uh, things that are on purpose there to make the life of everyone around it safer. There is audit, there is security, there is regulation, there is procurement, there is change control, there are legacy systems, there are a lot of things around it. Your fancy Kubernetes application that you're building now is gonna be legacy in five years. So do not take into account that legacy is a bad thing. Legacy usually is called legacy because it works. Uh, of course, this brings reflection of the culture with it. A company that has a lot of old software, old legacy, usually comes with some inertia, some blame, some blame, uh, some blame and some finger pointing because nobody wants to touch something that was built in Kobo in a mainframe because it is working. Why should you take that into account? But these enterprises, they want to move fast. They need to. Even a bank like ABN, they need to step their game every time because there is the fintech startup mindset coming with a lot of things. And uh, like, even though lots of them will collapse and fail and ABN is gigantic, they still need to make it better for their customer as Rabobank, as ING, as all the other banks. So let's imagine how a uh, small fintech would do an OS upgrade. Let's imagine a fintech that just got funded has 10 engineers. They have to upgrade routes 7.6 to 7.7. .7. How does that usually happen? The CTO goes into the person that is typing. Hey, can you upgrade this for me? Yeah, sure. I'll do it this afternoon. Then he goes there, changes his Ansible script or whatever, changes his packer, changes the image, start deploying, do a canary deployment. If something breaks into that, they have what? 5,000 customers, 1,000 customers, some problems, they may have some issues with some regulations, but things can be sorted out. Then they have the auditor, you can explain, yeah, we should have not done that. Imagine that happened here at ABM. How does an OS upgrade happen here? Go through all this change process, all these things, because if you've done like that in a place like ABN and something went wrong, heads would grow. People would get fired. Auditors will be barging in. It's not possible to act as the same way. Thousands of problems would appear from this. And architecture should be different. But one concept that I think it is extremely important, it is uh, we have here some Java developers, maybe some PHP, some Go, some Python. And let me tell you something. Architecture, even in software, it is something that it is better for you, unique for you. It is subjective. Just like this building or this building or that building, people may find it ugly, better to look, nicer to move in into other stuff. If I see a microservice application built on top of Scala with Akka, I love it at the same time and together with uh, Haskell because that's where I come from. And if I see somebody talking about PHP application, I'll be like, oh my God, PHP application, that must be horrible. Because that's where I come from. That's where I, what I have more relationship with. And that's the same thing with everything that we do. What we know, we usually find it better or we take more into account than what we don't know. We have fear of this unknown. So the Cone Cathedral or the Glyphon in uh, Munich or the Le Corbusier home may be different places. But there are some standards to it. That means that if you want to build a modernist house like Le Corbusier did, there are standards of what a modernist house is. If you want to build a Gothic cathedral like the Cone one, there are standards and things that characterize it. 
there are standards and things to build a Spring API. There are standards to build an Acre application. There are standards to build a machine learning. These things will change, will improve. We, there are going to be some specific needs that you have to change, but that doesn't mean that different architectures are better or worse than other ones. They have and serve different purposes. And that comes a lot with this nice book from the end of the 90s called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. That is a book where they discuss how an open source thing, the first one, Linux, was built compared to how an OS from Microsoft was built on the 90s, kind of like. How one is a cathedral perspective where you don't know where the blueprints come from, things are there, it's built like this, while in the Linux ecosystem, the bizarre way, you start with one person, Linus, starting to build something in the open eyes of a lot of people and people start to adding things around it and building a bazaar around it. It is better? No. It is more good looking? No. It's just different, serves a different purpose. And on the enterprise itself, what I see a lot is this. Enterprise architects, domain, business architects, solutions architects, and usually me and the teams here as grunts actually doing the implementation. The engineering teams have to deploy the features and the stuff that they're hired for. And again, what we learn from the DevOps movement, all about the Go book from Elijah, uh, all about the theory of constraints, or about the flow of constant feedback, small teams, independence, the three ways. How can this fit into that? How can you have an independent team here if they cannot even choose what they're going to build and how they're going to build because they have someone else to approve? And worse, usually this person here, they haven't touched a line of code since Oracle 7. So it all comes down to, are, are these people useless? Of course not. These people have so much knowledge. They know so much about the companies that they are. But one thing that I really, really advocate for is that these people should not be dictating what these people do. These people know a lot about the business, know a lot about uh, legacy applications, know a lot about the use case. They know who to talk to. They know a lot about the inner politics. But they, these people should not dictate what these people do. Because this, again, is the perspective. You are here asking to, can I use Prometheus now instead of this stuff? Can we move to something else outside of Nagios, please? Can we do something else? And they'll be like, why? When I was a developer, Nagios worked fine. This is a different world. Things move fast and we want to try out new things. One of the things that I miss uh, uh, more here is the idea of the Hey, if you want to try this new view application, just build one and make your business case out of it. Yeah, okay. Let's build a view application that has to be used in production. Can I have access to AD so I can have real users or stuff like this? No, you're crazy. No, you cannot have access to AD. Okay, can I log this into Splunk? No, we are out of licenses. No, just build your application on your laptop and make a proof of concept on your laptop. How is this close to reality? How is this a sandbox? A sandbox should be a place that you can play around, but close to production systems. So we should have a testing AD. We should have a testing account for Splunk. We should have a testing Kubernetes cluster or namespace. We should have this stuff to be able to play with it. If we don't get this, we cannot play and develop new stuff. So. What I've been trying to do to overcome this is implementing what I call the stream of architect in some places. A stream of architect is a thing that usually gets me in a lot of uh, uh, bad places with architects in the company. Because I say, we don't need more full-time architects. And this usually comes with a lot of uh, pushback. Uh, and I say, we don't need architects. We need developers from the teams to be able to architect and design. And when I say this, this, they sometimes get a little bit, ooh, 
but what I'm going to do when developers, okay, so every lead, every tech lead or something is going to be an architect. I mean, like, no. You should include juniors, you should include meniors, you should include seniors, and you should have an X number of members. Here I put five, but let's say that you're talking about uh, eight teams that are building something. I would say you should have eight people involved on this stream of architects. One person from each team make a blend of juniors, meters, and seniors, make it random, and make it with a mandate. Every week, someone joins and somebody leaves, and they have five weeks of mandates, or three weeks of mandates, or four weeks of mandates. And they meet once every week. In a Kata Spire environment, that means that they're always looking for improvement, and they have one main goal, that is dissemination, but they have to get, uh, they have to give advice with standards. Ooh. Ooh. They have to give advice. That means that you create a standard, or they, there, there are standards, but they are not enforced. So if you want to do CI CD with uh, Jenkins, Okay, we have Circle CI here. Here are the here are all the manifests, all the things that you have to do for Circle CI. We pay for the license for this. If you want to use Jenkins, implement it yourself and do it. And other thing that I also say is, uh, some people were asking me about SRE at first. You always need a platform or an SRE team at some point. And if you don't follow the standards, you can do it, but you are on call. If you don't. If you want to go with the standards of the company and go do all the checklists and follow up this stuff, so the platform and the SRE team is going to be the one on call. Sometimes this checklist and these standards have to be specific for some teams and make things more complex, but it works. But it's important that these meetings are about technology, but with the business mindset. Right? What is this good for? Should we be talking about new ways of logging now, or is this fine? Are there any other priorities that we have to discuss? How are we doing uh, deployment of uh, machine learning models on this team, on that team? Can we come into a standard? No, we cannot because that is a very, very specific team that has a very, very specific problem that doesn't meet the other one. Okay, let's keep the two separated now. And we need to document this. We need to make it available to other people or to new teams. So you will always have that problem that there are four teams in the same company working on the same stuff. This will, ever, this will never ever end, especially on large companies like ABN. But the goal is to try to disseminate all of these things. And usually when I come with this, there is a very big problem on the transition phase. That means that you have to plan, you have to think about how you're gonna transition that, how your old school architects are gonna take that news that they are not the ones responsible for designing anymore. Uh, so that varies a lot from place to place. Uh, but your, your end goal is to have your old generation and the new generation working together. So one common goal. So I'm trying this stream architect in some places. It's really, really nice. But again, I'm not selling this. So try, please. Let me know how is it going. Uh, it's not perfect, it's not scientific, it's not anything related to it. What I try to do is just applying methodologies to some, some things that may people some may consider it common sense. I'm always trying new stuff. Uh, so if you want to ask questions or discuss or curse me or anything, now it's the time. So thanks for it and I'm waiting for the questions. Yes. Oh. Um, thanks. Uh, very uh, uh, inspiring and uh, I would say controversial. Yep. <laughs> have you, okay, you said you tried it already. Um, yes. Have you found anywhere else something in a similar uh, way implemented? So you have ivory towers, you have those uh, chain of commands and all those people there, architects, and now you say, okay, we try to blend, of course, you don't want to let anyone go, so you try to blend all the existing architects. Yep. Um, 
it is interesting concept. Um, so two questions. Um, in your experience, you tried it with the customers, uh, so some looked a little bit strange, the other ones were <laughs> happy. Did it work? And how did it work? And the second one, uh, also kind of related to, um, what was your uh, inspiration in to go into that direction to actually have that stream of architects? Yeah, so the first is the place that I've implemented. Um, it's a little bit tough because when you go to companies that are like this, you don't have one person here that is responsible for all of this. This no. is very organically built. If you have this, yeah. you have an enterprise which is large. Yeah, and for, for, for example, this, this enterprise architects, they are usually working in companies from five to 20 years. They know everyone around, and if you tell them that they're not gonna do something, they're just like, go ballistic with it. So what I usually do is I go into this level and I try to extinguish this layer, the solutions architect, at least. So no more solutions architects. They are all developers part of teams and they can have higher salaries, whatever they negotiated uh, before because they were architects and being a part of these teams, they can, they can uh, start to work together and I put on this layer here, this stream. That makes a lot, a lot, a lot easier what I saw to, to negotiate with this layer. Because now the knowledge is spread. When you, are, when you are here negotiating with this layer, sometimes you have this solution architect that knows that business architect a little bit better and used to work together on a previous company and they have coffee and beer together and all of this. So this one here always get his idea through and all of it. And by doing this around and make this stream, you kind of disseminate everything and you don't have those favors, exchanges, and stuff like that happening. So that can be bad for some people, but I think that for the overall company is better. And I've, uh, I've been in one place where they were trying to implement this on this, oh, on this layer. We tried to implement this on this layer and we failed because it is sometimes these domain architects are related to three areas of the company Sometimes it's one VP with another VP or one manager with another manager. So here we start to get into a very, 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 very complex thing. So what I can say that I have succeeded is on extinguish this layer. How to go and to build up this, I'm trying and I'm still looking for answers and if there are answers to it, maybe just a dead end. Just looking at the business and domain architects, um, you said it yourself at the beginning, they have a lot of knowledge, and uh, but there is also a disconnect from actual world and actual engineering team, developing teams. But that knowledge should not go into waste. So, no. do you have any ideas yeah. for the future? Actually, how to still empower those business yeah. architects, but still kind of have not that ivory tower. Yeah. So, ones. so for me, this domain biz architects and this enterprise architects, they should be a side layer not something that uh, he has the power to approve or to say yes or no, more but like more like as a consultant thing or somebody that has to actively raise their hand like, hey, what they're trying to build here, I think it's not GDPR compliant or something like that, but not this way of let's build something, send to them, and then a committee one month later come back to you to say if it is okay or no to go without proper feedback. But exactly how to, how to, how to, actually, how to actually structure that, it, 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 it it is something that I am 100% sure it will be company to company, case to case, culture to culture, because sometimes you, you don't have three layers, you have four, sometimes you don't have four, you have two. Sometimes you have uh, the, the CISO team and the security team as a separate side, kind of like just come in uh, monthly and say like, no, you cannot put this in production because no, we cannot do this. Uh, so it changes a lot. I, like, like I said, this is not a silver bullet. I, I think it is something that I try to inspire people of, try to think of a different way of doing this. And about places that I know that are similar, not, not that are similar, but uh, I, have, I know a lot of people and I worked a lot with uh, Vacamp and Vacamp has no architects at all. No enterprise architects, no domain architects, no business architects, no social architects, nothing. 
they just have engineers and developers, and that's it. And they are quite a big company nowadays. So when they started, maybe this was uh, something clear that they said, but nowadays uh, they have quite a nice infrastructure, everything on AWS and a lot of stuff without actually having architects. Yeah, sorry. Um, Tiago, it seems that there is a big challenge for big organizations to implement these new frameworks, and especially those orange hierarchical like you are stating there. Um, Against those challenges, is, is there any case study where these applications actually shows or better profitability, better results, or I understand better results, of course, but in how you could go and persuade a company that yep. is very hierarchical? Yeah, so for example, uh, do I don't know if you've ever heard about the doc the Dr. Nicole Forsgren from the Dora Institute and the Accelerate and the State of uh, DevOps uh, book. Uh, uh, Nicole, at several, several, several points on this last five to six years that she has been doing this, she, she pinpoints every year some findings and they have been consistent for the last six years that moving faster is actually better for the profit of the company. It's, it involves less security breaches, less re-scraping of code, so, uh, but, she also found out that people that are starting the journey usually have a setback. So when you start to move faster, you usually have more problems and more stuff, but if you overcome that first uh, plateau and then you move, then you actually can do that. So what a lot of companies are doing is trying to go into this, then they start to see problems and then they push back. No, 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 this is not gonna work with all this freedom, let's go to safe. And uh, then you start to see all the problems that uh, things fixed as safe can bring to a company. Because, uh, and here I'm here on the personal opinion, I don't think that fixed stuff are the way to go anywhere. Companies have different cultures, have different ways of doing stuff, picking up safe and following like it is stated on the document or on the graph, it's not gonna be good for any company, I think, because companies have different interactions, different ways of doing stuff. There are some cool things around safe, some nice things around Kanban, some nice things around Scrum. Mix and blend, build things from scratch, try what works for your company and keep changing. Do not use things as a dogma. But again, what I know that it works, it's going faster and given independence, freedom and blameless to developers. If a developer feels safe to try something he will be more creative, he will be more profitable, he will generate better for your company than if he has just to follow. Because if he just has to follow orders, he will just be like the nine to five kind of person that will just go there and say like, ah, they want me to build this feature that I think it is not worth it or something like that just because a PO says. No, the PO, if he believes on that, he has to test, he has to show with data. If you show things with data, instead of just bossing around and whipping this is how we do, and give them freedom to also show data back to you, you start to get better people. Because again, moving faster, I can prove that, gets better profit for the companies. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, German Mike man, Vivek. Nice. Cool, thanks, Ed. Really fun. Fun idea, fun concept. Yeah. Maybe I'll just also say I, th I think there's a connection with the goal book, with the whole this multidisciplinary team. I think that might be an inspiration, right? Like an yeah. injury team trying to fix a company. Um, qu I have a question which is a bit related to the previous one. So imagine an organization says, yeah, that's fun, I like it, let's give it a try for a year uh, and check it if it works. So how would you measure what the success is What's, what's the KPI, what are the metrics say, yeah, this we get better with uh, this new setup. Yeah, so first, I would not go full Big Bang in the entire company. I would select a set of teams that are interrelated and have, for example, a layer of solutions architect and put them all together. And I would start measuring with the, not the four, but three of the KPIs that uh, Nicole uh, starts to use, and that is the the time to, the, to actually actually deploy something after it's finished from the development until it reaches 
the, uh, the production, mm -hmm. mean time to failure, like, and also I don't like the, the, the scraping percentage because I don't know how you calculate that. For example, how, how much code do you know that you have to rework afterwards? How do you know that you are reworking some, some code? I'm a little bit skeptical about that uh, KPI. And uh, I forgot the last KPI. I idea to production? What? Idea to production. Yeah, yeah, so that is the first one that I mentioned. Oh yeah, okay. from idea to deploy, yeah, yeah. Yeah, from idea to production is a little bit tough because actually how do you measure that? For example, if you're talking about a PO that gets an idea from a client, is about that time that he gets the idea or when he writes in the backlog? And what if he writes in the, in the backlog and then he just edits the JIRA ticket to something else because they discuss on the meeting that this was not about this, this was about that. So this idea to production for me is hard. For me it's about when the developer finishes the work and it goes into uh, uh, production and I'm missing one, I have to remember afterwards. Uh, but again, I think one of the things that you feel a lot when you start doing this is people will notice and on happiness per se, things will get better, but that is very hard to measure. If you know how to measure uh, employee happiness, let's talk and we open a, a startup on this and make a lot of money. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, a lot of company measure happiness, but is it okay? Is it, is it the, the best way or I don't know? They measure what? Mood. Yeah, I don't know, maybe they have cameras seeing if someone is happy with their recognition API or? Well, if you don't store the data or if someone hire, uh, when they hire, they sign that they were okay with it, maybe it's okay, I don't know. Anybody else have more comments, questions, or you can just, uh, yeah. Um, I have a question when the team is uh, only developers. Uh, I currently work at the city of Amsterdam and we hired a lot of uh, um, um, developers uh, to build, build a new infrastructure, it's great. I'm really enjoying it as a business uh, analyst and data analyst, so I'm into Python and, and the whole Jenkins stuff, and I really enjoy it, but what is quite difficult is that um, the, um, the, the, the main, the tech leads, are now the new becoming the new architects, so they dictate quite a lot, and we have left, uh, been left with a lot of um, good developers who ran out of our uh, um, uh, organization because of that, because they didn't get like the, the communication in order to, well, they, they even argue together, together in the room to find the best solution. That was a great time. And they come out and like, yeah, we found a solution. Those were two guys who could get along because they both wanted the best thing happen. But now we have some guy who's getting on the platform and he has to has to get allowed to make all the decisions but they're not the right ones for in comparison with some other lead developers so um, did you have that same experience when they started with this new um, setup with well getting the discussion rolling yeah so one of the important things and what I say should have a mix of junior meter and senior is exactly to try to to phase out a little bit of this best speaker or loudspeaker effect. Because if you say it's a democracy here on this room, I'm pretty sure some people can convince others just by talking more and talking louder, and the other ones will be just like, yeah, 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 fuck this guy, let, let him have it, yeah, 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 I'm j I just wanna go home. And so you kind of have that winning by making someone tired of you, mindset on the company as well. And that will end after a long time of people actually leaving the company because they feel that they are not appreciated and their opinion is not taken into account anyhow. So why should I stay here more than two years or something like that? Uh, but also I see some other back push from people that don't want to architect and design. Sometimes some people is sorted to go into the stream and they feel like, but I'm junior, I don't know what to think, I, or I don't wanna think about all the systems perspective and all of this, I don't wanna take that to account. And that is also something that I find really, really valuable because you can try to nurture that in, in the person, or you can know like, oh, this person doesn't want to design and architect the system, maybe they shouldn't be a developer. 
Uh, and I mean that with the best of the intents because I think architecting and design is part of development. If you just want to, to write things per se of writing things, writing a function, well, you have to think about the overall systems and the impacts of the things that you are doing. Of course, you don't need to know everything about all the libraries, but at least having the openness to understand that what you do is not just you and your laptop. Our work as a developer, as a software engineer, is a lot more about how we interface with other people and with systems and how we achieve the overall goal of the company than actually writing a function. And if people do not get that, I actually do not want them working on my teams. So if I find someone like that, I'm okay with them leaving the company. So, yeah, I hope that answers, but I hope you don't fire a lot of people tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else? Everybody wants to go home, right? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the question is on the stream of architects. Uh, you had mentioned that you should have a pool of developers, starting from senior to junior. And if I'm not wrong, you also mentioned that you have to rotate them yes. from the team. Every week somebody should leave and somebody should come in. <coughs> How will the continuity be there, the knowledge? Because you ideate something, right? You try to do something. That's the whole idea of having that group or a circle. And how is the continuity going to be? Because you're going to think about a new solution. And say one developer leaves, another developer from the same team joins. How is he going to get that knowledge what was discussed in the last week? Yeah. How is that continuity going to be? Yeah, so we tried. I try to, to, to actually make that with not making everybody on board and off board every week. So you have a mandate, let's say four weeks. So every week somebody joins and you, after four weeks you leave. And that number of weeks should be the same as the size of the place. So if you say, let's know, uh, it's a five week, it's a five uh, teams. So we want a five stream of architects with five weeks. So every five weeks there is a new team on board, but there is always overlap. And having that overlap that from one week to the other, you always have four people together. That uh, is what I try to push to give continuity. But I also think that it's good to not have continuity at some point because that means that people need to share. Like if you leave and in the next week, somebody from your team comes on board and they have a completely different opinion than you have, then or he's gonna be convinced by the other four that what you discussed before was better or they're probably gonna reach out to you to say like, hey, that guy is not according to this because of that. And th this improved communication is what I, what I like to see it better. But again, there are, there are upsides and downsides, but how it is now, I think it has more downsides than the stream, usually. Because what it is now is just one, two, three, four, five people, always the same, discussing that. But usually what I found is that there is one person that leads this thing. There is one loudspeaker, one more technological, more leading person that actually voices over everything. So I try to replace that one person by two, three, four, five, that will constantly change. But I hope. Yeah, so I hope to couch that with, I hope to couch that uh, problem to have some safeness in actually rotating that. That was the oh, that that was the, the the whole idea of changing people every week. Well, if you want to try this, try it. Let me know in a few weeks how it is going. I'd love to. And thanks again. Let's have a drink, right? Drink or just cola. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>